obviously. Right. But I think many people are unaware that many do. So that's one reason. Okay. Another reason I think has to do with the fact that the religious right is known to be opposed to things like pulling the plug. And a lot of people have a sort of simplistic idea that if you oppose the religious right, that makes you right and makes you sophisticated. Mm. Um, and another reason, frankly, of course, people don't want to spend money on the old and ill. They're not glamorous. Right. And that is that is kind of a problem that's uh, coming up now with uh, uh, the... It, it, it's certainly a thorny issue with the proposals for uh, of a single-payer or more universal health care system in the United States and... I find... How are, right. uh, yeah, you know, how, the cost, how are people going to pay for that, and what, at what point do you tell, you know, what point are there going to be bureaucrats saying, okay, that you are going to cost too much money to the system and uh, we're going to have to end your life? I, I mean, I mean it's, it's kind of, I mean, I don't know how else to put it, but that does seem to be uh, a, a, a flavor of the argument that's uh, going on with the uh, debate for universal health care. This is something really dangerous. It's true that there are no proposals for death panels, no. but that's really much too easy because there were proposals for things that are almost as dangerous. This talk about advanced directives and end-of-life counseling as a cost-cutting measure is obviously intended to steer people in the direction of foregoing life-sustaining care. I am very distressed by the fact that President Obama, whom I voted for and was very enthusiastic about and still think rather well of in most respects, yeah. is thinking of taking money out of Medicare. He should take money out of the huge military budget we have, and he should tax the rich more heavily, rather than treat old people as expendable. I find that really interesting and frightening. I'm also very bothered by the fact that his special advisor for health care, Ezekiel Emanuel, is on record of saying, is saying that when there are scarce resources, they should go to the young before the old. He should be thrown out. He's a bigot. It's, it's really quite alarming. Um, it in is. fact, this bi I want to stress that this bias counseling is already going on. In my state, the Rhode Island Department of Health distributes a durable power of attorney for health care. A page on it that's, that's called Commonly Used Life Support Measures says, for the dying patient, mechanical ventilation often merely prolongs the dying process until some other bodily system fails. This is an obviously biased presentation. Instead of saying, mechanical ventilation for the dying patient will keep you alive without curing your underlying illness. Some people want this and some people don't. So we already have biased oh, counsel going oh, on. Yeah. Mm, that is yeah, to me, you know, being a, a life extension advocate, that is a little bit disturbing. And some people say, well, uh, we have finite resources. There's no way we can uh, provide, uh, you know, treatment to everyone. But uh, I, I feel there is a psychological uh, difference here, which you just highlighted in the wording of how, you know, it's, uh, prolonging someone's, uh, prolonging, not prolonging their life, but uh, just waiting for them to die. Th th those are two kind of uh, distinct psychological uh, premises there. Uh, and it in, in, in indicates a bias in thinking. And in, in, in my uh, experience, I've always thought that we shouldn't give up on people because of cost. We should just redouble our efforts to find resources and to uh, to help people live longer. Uh, I ab absolutely agree. And what's more, it wouldn't be hard. We could get out of Afghanistan. That would free up a lot of resources. Yeah. And you know what? We don't have to save every penguin and polar bear. People are the most important part of the environment, and keeping them alive should come first. This is an example of how both the right and the left give sick old people inadequate priority. All right. Uh, one, uh, I don't, I'm not sure if this is so much um, of your, uh, your expertise here, but one of the audience members did ask about human enhancement, enhancing our abilities. And I guess you did touch on this a little bit. Uh, when you mentioned Kurzweil and his view on uh, extending our abilities, but uh, someone uh, asked about the ethical implications of that because there does seem to be some overlap beside, be, between the secular arguments against life extension and, of course, human enhancement. And I would say you, you would, your position would be that, yes, uh, enhancement and life extension are both valuable pursuits. Is that correct? Absolutely. Okay. That's absolutely right. And, uh, and one other question that came in a little bit earlier and something that I had thought about uh, as well was about uh, reaching uh, more people about 
life extension. Um, you know, as we mentioned earlier, in academia, it seems there are many. There's much secular resistance to uh, life extension, and I find that in uh, out uh, on the streets. You know, just talking to uh, the man on the street, uh, that there seems to be a natural um, resistance to life extension. I was wondering if you had any advice for how to approach the issue, or how to uh, speak about the issue, how to reach more people uh, and convince them of the value of life extension. Since life extension is inherently good, I think the thing to do is attack the bad arguments against it. Like if someone says, well, I think it's a bad thing, ask him why, ah. and then criticize the reason. Like, okay. why do you really suppose you would get bored? Or why is it more important to say ails than to save the sick old people? Or why are you assuming that life isn't worth living on a respirator? Have you talked to anyone on a respirator? And so forth. Right. I, I, that's one thing I hadn't thought about either is uh, people who assume that the old and infirm would want to, you know, end their life, just naturally say they want to pull the plug, you know, that's the common phrase, uh, to ask them, hey, have you ever talked to someone in that situation? Uh, and I, I wonder, uh, not many have. I, I wonder if that would be the case. Or you give them an example like Stephen Hawking and then say, is it only that he's a scientific genius that makes his life worthwhile? Or is it that he's able to go places, that he's able to have friends, that he has enough money, and so forth? Sure. All right. Well, uh, wonderful advice. Thank you so much, uh, Felicia and you. And I would also uh, like to, uh, to close things up here. Uh, do you have any other, uh, anything else you would like to promote or say? Uh, perhaps a, a conference you might be attending up uh, soon or a book that's coming out? Uh, anything that... Uh you would like um, to I do have a book that will be coming out when I finish it oh. called <laughs> Bioethics Through Fiction, which involves seven of my short stories, eight essays about them, and some of them do deal with this very issue, the issue of how life is worth living even if other people think it isn't and how it's worth going for high-tech cures and so or even just for an extra 10 days. If that's all you can get. It's better than nothing. So there will be a book of both stories and essays about this, and the value, I hope, of the stories is for people who can't imagine why anybody who's old and old would want to live. If a story of this sort works, it enables you to enter imaginatively into that person's life yeah. and feel what he has to live for. Yeah, and that is an interesting point there, too. It seems, though, uh, that fiction, a media, a film, uh, and the music uh, plays an important role. We were talking about uh, how to uh, get through to more people about the value of life extension, that it is inherently good. And uh, one thing, I guess, uh, I'm very happy to hear that you're writing, uh, compiling a book of uh, fiction stories in support of life extension. Uh, uh, I can't wait for that to come out. I'm sure the audience members as well uh, are excited. Thank you to very much. That. And uh, with that, I uh, will conclude our interview for tonight. Uh, thank you so much for answering all our questions, and uh, thank you for much, uh, so much for your advocacy as well for the value of life extension. Thank you for having me, and I want to thank your, inter your institute for its advocacy, which is extremely valuable. Thank you very much. All right. Have a good evening. Good night. All right. There you have it. Felicia. Nimue Ackerman, professor at Brown University, professor of philosophy. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Wow, is she an advocate for life extension? And if you didn't read her uh, long paper in the Oxford Bioethics Handbook, you can look up it on Google Books, uh, the Google Book search. Uh, you can look it up and you will see uh, all of those arguments that she presented here tonight as well. Uh, and boy, I, 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 I was amazed how she just slices and dices all of those arguments that we, you know, many of you, I know you in the audience there, many of you um, all, always come up, you know, boredom? Is that an argument against life extension? Are you kidding me? Uh, or overpopulation? I know there are you know, resource issues, sure, but do you let people die just because you're afraid it's, you know, overpopulation can't? Isn't there another solution that we can work on? Uh, so th that was very uh, wonderful to hear. What a breath of fresh air. I don't know who said that earlier in the chat uh, tonight. A breath of fresh air to hear uh, Professor Ackerman uh, slice and dice all of the uh, counter arguments to life extension. All right. Well, as promised, we have some news here also coming up uh, about some fundraising opportunities that I want to talk about tonight. We're going to move on to our graphics once again. And I want to thank Florence.
Kappa.